Yes, guys, how you doing? Welcome back to the Spurs Talk Show. I am Sean Butler. I hope you are all happy and healthy doing the things that you love with those that you love doing them with. Bugsy Malone's just down here having a little rest, but if she starts to bark, I apologize in advance. Also, I've got the mic thing with me, but the battery's low on it, and so again, again it might, might disappear, and, uh, and then you might hear pops, and I'm sorry if that's the case. Guys, let's get straight into it. Before we do, can I ask you for some favors on this lovely Saturday morning? If you don't mind, hit the like button for me. I'll be very, very appreciative. Uh, your like game is incredibly strong for this channel. The last 10 videos have had over 1,500 likes, I think, now. And that's just absolutely amazing. And it's helping the channel grow. And I can't be more appreciative um, than I am. I promise you, I'm very, very grateful. Hit the subscribe button as well if you haven't already. If you're just new around here, welcome. Hit the notification bell and drop a comment. Please drop some comments. Let me know your thoughts on these various topics because we try to play the devil's advocate on the transfer news views and clues that are in the stories, in the press, in the online media today. Let's start with Archie Gray at Leeds. Alan Hutton has said that Archie Gray suits Ange perfectly and according to reports, Archie Gray is either neck and neck with this player Vanderson at Monaco, who we'll talk about in a minute, uh, or as, as the front runner to replace Emerson Royale as our backup right back slash also versatile number six. The reason why Alan Hutton said he suits us perfectly is because he's 18 years old, he's English, he's a homegrown um, solution, which is something that's very, very important and pressing for Tottenham right now. But also, of course, in the 47 appearances that he had last season for Leeds in the Championship as an 18-year-old, which is incredible, he played a lot of them at right-back, but also filled in as a number six. And so with Tottenham needing support in the six role and also our inverted fullback system kind of generally transitioning right-backs into triple pivot midfielders to some degree during the offensive side of the game anyway, um, you can understand why Alan Hutton would say that he's a perfect fit. For me, I'm very much on board with the guy. I'd, lo I'd love to see him at Tottenham. I think he's going to be a superstar in English football. I think he's going to be valued a lot more in the future than he is right now. Having said that, the valuation that Leeds are putting on his head is eye-watering. £50 million for an 18-year-old that has only proven it at the championship level, I think is a bridge too far for me, given how much we have to do, given how how important the, uh, the other areas that we need help in are and the fact that you can't always go for versatility. Versatility is fantastic. It gives you options and it kills two birds with, with, with one stone at times. However, in key positions, you need specificities. And in the six, I think you do need to go and get someone who's a monster in one, a master of one, not a jack of all trades. And I don't mind Archie Gray coming in to be the right back and also a six in rotation and you know can do all those things. That's great. But if he was the solution to be the six that fixes the problems of last season, I'm not sure we can take that chance yet. He hasn't proven it at the top level. And so it's too much of a risk and too much of a responsibility on a 19-year-old, a will-be 19-year-old's head. Even if you include Joe Roden in the deal and it becomes a net 36 million, 38 million pound transfer, then that's obviously more palatable. But it still takes up the lion's share of the budget when Tottenham still need to go and find a striker. And strikers are in high demand, short supply, and are probably, you know, on, on average, the most expensive kind of pound for pound for pound position to have to go and uh, fulfil. We need another winger, and as I say, they they are ten a penny at the moment, but they're still not cheap. If you want to go and get one of the highest calibre, which I hope that we do, whether that's a Rafinha, a Neto, or any of the others we've been linked with, Nico Williams, etc. And so I just I worry a little bit about the price tag. I think it's a little bit of a bridge too far, step too far, given how much more we need to do. But if we can get some players out the door early, like if an Emerson Royale deal can be achieved relatively quickly for near enough the money that we're asking, around £20 million, if Lo Celso's interest is significant, if we can get that deal done, if Joe Roden does go to Leeds in the next couple of days, if all of that sort of thing is handled early and we're clearer on what our overall budgets are, then I think the Archie Gray story can be done a little bit later on in the window. It doesn't need to be prioritised right now, in my opinion. I think getting the, the striker finished and getting maybe the midfielder job done, whether that's a Conor Gallagher, whether that is somebody else in the sixth role, is far more important, just so we can see where we are after we've done the most important business, and then we can figure out how much budget is left over and make the right decisions around 
the areas where we need support, but we don't need first team positions in the immediacy. So with that being said, guys, I'm not trying to pour cold water over the Archie Gray deal. I'd love to see it done. It's just, you know, you, can't, you have to try and make ends meet and try and to figure out how is the best way to, to juggle all of the, the desires with what is realistic at the moment. Um, let's move on to the next story anyway. Sam Illing Jr. He, actually, no, before Sam Illing Jr., let's go back to Vanderson. He was the second name on that list. Monaco player. We've been linked with him before last summer. I think I've done two videos on Vanderson. I'm not going to spend too much time going into the details on him. I'll put the stats on the screen as I always do. I'll go through a little bit of detail, but if you do want to go and look at a previous video I made about Vanderson, if I can find it, I'll put the link for it up there uh, from a year ago. But essentially, Brazilian player, right back for Monaco, came through the Gremio system, which is a system that is known in Brazil, allegedly, I've, I've been informed, for its kind of uh, versatility in positional development. They, they're sort of taught balance. And so as a right back, you can look at this guy and see he has that Brazilian flair, the desire to get forward, the desire to take the ball and travel forward and approach the game as if he's an, a, an aggressive um, kind of forward looking player but also has the ability to get back and to tuck in. He reads the game well. He's got a strong footballing IQ. He's very fast. And look, I, I, I do remember doing a lot of due diligence. I haven't done it recently. So this is maybe my memory of him is a year old. A year old and um, maybe that's out of date now. But, but what it's worth at the time, I remember thinking he was a little bit technically weak, technically naive, needed to work on some of the kind of first touches stuff. But when he gets the control of the ball, he's very good at moving with it. He's got a good vision. Uh, he can look up and, and pick a pass quite, quite nicely. Uh, contributes as well. Uh, 84 games, I think he's played for Monaco. Uh, six goals and nine assists. So 15 GA in 84. That's about one in every five games, which is a pretty good ratio for... Uh, for a right back and like I say if you go and do some uh, some Y Scout work or go and look at the, the everything reels on YouTube I'm pretty sure you'll still see uh, the same sort of things right he's very clever with his dribbling he likes to, to take to travel with the ball at pace and positionally he, he knows where to be at the right time got a nice little finish on him as well good shot he's very confident on the ball and I don't mind him I don't mind it at all um, does, does it excite me as a, as a signing it's, I mean it's okay but like I think that I mean, if he's going to cost 30 million or 25, 28 million pound, I think is the, is the touted number, then for me, I'd rather go and try and probably pay the extra five or six million plus Joe Roden, go and get Archie Gray done and look for one for the future in Archie Gray that's ready now, but it's going to be amazing in you know, two or three years time. And also he's a homegrown number, which solves a problem that, that Vanderson doesn't. So interesting link. He's been around for a while. Like I say, it's been, it's, it's been something that he's been linked to Tottenham for nearly two years. So um, I'm not sure it will happen, but you know what? These people have got to make up the links and I've got to bring them to your attention. All right, Bugsy wants the ball and I'm going to give you the next name. The next name, guys, is Samuel Illing Jr. You'll know this one, youngster from Juventus. 12 and a half million pounds is what Juve want for the guy. He was described by Juve's uh, young talent as one of the most promising uh, Juve youth talents he's ever seen, likened to Alfonso Davies, plays on the left wing but can play left wing back, uh, very kind of balanced, can get back and do the defensive work, but obviously would be seen more as a left wing forward. He also is home, or would count as home grown in a world where we signed him. Now, I'm not sure if the link is just being rehashed and resurfaced because it's a Saturday and it's a slow news day or whether there's anything more material, but I didn't see anything new in the story other than that Tottenham are re-emerging, re engaging their interest in Samuel Illing Jr. I listen, I'll be entirely honest, of all of the wingers that we've, we've been linked with over the last two or three months, this guy for me is really the least um, appetizing. Like I said, I was, I'm on board with the idea of Timo Werner being here as a rotation, as long as the next guy that comes in is stronger, better, bigger name, brand, and someone that really does move the needle. And for me, Samuel Illing Jr. doesn't do that. So if this story is the one that emerges to be true, and then our winger options, our winger forward signings for the summer are Samuel Illing Jr. and Timo Werner. Then I have a massive problem with that. And I will go apoplectic. But I don't believe it will happen. 20 years old though. And for what it's worth, he has already made 45 first team appearances for Juve. Which is no mean feat for a 20 year old. Think how few 20 year olds have done that for 
Tottenham Hotspur. Guys, last two stories of the day. Christian Falk, uh, the, the German uh, Sky Sports Germany guy who knows everything about Bayern Munich. And he's always bang on the money when it comes to Bayern Munich stories. He's been in Twitter this morning and he's been pushing the same story I brought to you a couple of days ago around Chris Furyk, the, uh, the, the winger from Stuttgart and that Tottenham and Bayern Munich are going head to head for Furyk. And so I obviously think, oh, if, if, if this is moving from just aggregators and kind of ragtops into the world of people that actually are in the know, especially when it comes to a rival bidder for the player, then I better take a little bit more interest. And so I went and did a little bit more due diligence on this Furyk guy. And look, he's, as I said to you before, I'll put his numbers back up on the screen. I think his numbers look really good. And I didn't know too much about him. I've gone into detail. Now I've gone into the Y Scout and looked more and more at his, you know, in the individual departments of his game. What's he like at taking players on? What's his final ball like? How good is he at getting his head up and picking the right pass in the right moment? The final decision in key moments. Is there the, enough visibility there for me to, to think that I'm excited about it? Because on paper, he does look good. And if you go to YouTube, you'll think this guy is class. And I've got to be honest, when I've gone into the deeper I've gone, the more I think this guy will frustrate us. The more I think this guy has a little bit of the Timo Werner in him where lots of, and maybe the Brennan Johnson for the first half of the season, lots of kind of early movement, lots of, you know, nice one touch, one, two passes, lots of early engagement in a move, but then too many times, I'm not saying every time because his numbers don't suggest every, every time, his numbers suggest he actually contributes a lot statistically, but from looking into, into detail, too high a frequency, I was seeing just at the key moment a, a, a sloppy pass that gave the ball away, or he just took it on one too many players and eventually got dispossessed, or a sloppy finish. And you know, maybe that explains why he's, he's got a release clause of 23 and a half million euros rather than being a 50 million pound player, 60 million pound player. I always say this, you know, in those sorts of positions, those wide positions, they're 10 a penny. This, every team has a player that can dribble with the ball. It's the way that the game has been played for the last 10 years. And so every player comes up who's, who's an offensive player and naturally wants to be that guy. The difference between the, the, the good and the great or the, you know, the very best and the level below is, is the final decision. And to me, this guy Furyk just looks a little bit like the frequency in which he makes the wrong decision at the end of the move. It's just a little too high for me from what I've seen. But I will always, I will always bow down to being wrong. And if someone is watching who comes from Germany, who, who knows Stuttgart, uh, who watches the Bundesliga religiously, I don't watch it religiously. I watch it as often as I can. But, you know, more often than not, the bigger, the, the bigger games rather than um, Stuttgart season closely. So much like Hiroki Ito, you know, I've got an understanding, much like Serhu Garassi, I've got an understanding of them. Um, and I'm familiar enough to give an opinion, but also humble enough to be corrected. So let me know your thoughts, guys. If you know this Chris Furyk guy better than I do, and I'm wrong about his final decision, then let me know. But that's the story that Tottenham and Bayern Munich are going after him. And look, if Bayern Munich are going after him, then maybe you know, maybe that is telling its own story, right? That he really is that good and he really is emerging as someone that should be looked at and respected more than the price tag suggests. Last story of the day, guys, is Ivan Tony. I missed out on getting this story to you yesterday by about five minutes. Uh, just, just it literally, the story broke just as I got home to upload the last video, and that is that Tottenham are readying a £40 million bid for Ivan Tony. Now, I know this one splits the fan base. What's interesting is when I've asked you guys about Ivan Tony in the past and say, put your comments in, do you want him, yes or no? Most of the reasons why people justify saying no, they don't want him, has nothing to do with the fact that he had a poor second half of last season and only scored four goals. It's to do with his attitude, to do with the fact that he didn't really apologise to Brentford and, you know, all about himself and whether or not that's a good fit for what we're trying to achieve, etc. You know, and that's valid. It's a very valid point. I completely agree with you. I also would throw into the mix that I don't know the reasons why he was gambling. If it's an addiction, then it might resurface. And we've seen what happened with Sandro Tonali. And that, to me, is a risk that you have to bake in. Um, you know, if it's also just the, if it's nothing to do with an addiction, just more, he doesn't care about the rules. And again, personality traits that are not going to be 
um, cohesive and in sync with what we're trying to achieve, especially what Angie's looking for. But I'm sure Angie will be able to figure that out with the phone call if it happens. At 40 million pound though, I really do think it's a, it's a good bit of business. I'm not worried about the fact that he only scored four goals last season. Of course, you can ask the question, well, was the absence disruptive? Did it put a dent into his confidence? Is, is he such a confidence slash arrogant guy that his entire footballing success and output is baked and based off of that kind of concept, that mindset, and then having too much time away from the game, having the people saying what they, the public saying what they did about him, maybe that, you know, dented his shell a, li a little bit. And, you know, is that, is that a concern? Or was it just unfamiliarity and a little bit too, you know, that, that with more time, we'll get back to seeing what his, his best is. And listen, for what it's worth, his best, put aside his arrogance, put aside any problems with his form, his very best at 40 million quid, you're not going to get much better for that sort of price anywhere else in Europe. And the fact that he's English, you'll count as homegrown. The fact that, you know, he, I think, offers us something that, Players like Richarlison don't. He's got a much better first touch. He's got much more clinical finishing generally. And I think he can, I think he can, if we can get the right solutions around on the wings, I think that we can really get close to recreating a 25 goal a season guy from him. And at 40 million quid, I think, it, I think there's good value in it. I really do. I'm okay with the transfer. I'd be excited if Tottenham were to sign him for 40 million quid rather than going bigger elsewhere, where you're still going to have risk, whoever you go for. Dusan Vlaevic, you've got the, no, the, the non-Premier League experience risk. If you go for uh, uh, Dominic Solanke, you have the, is he a one-season wonder uh, risk? Is he, you know going to make the step up in grade. If you go to uh, Santiago Jimenez, you're going to have the transition from the Dutch league risk. There's risk everywhere. It's always going to be difficult to replace what we haven't yet replaced in Harry Kane. But for me, Ivan Tony is logical and it makes sense. As long as Ange has the conversation and is convinced that the guy isn't going to be trouble, then I'm OK with it. I think that the valuation, I've said it's £40 million. That's just what is in the press. But you know that might be the starting point. And maybe Brentford want a lot higher. I personally think once you get above 50 million pound, then the value proposition becomes a little bit more difficult. But between 40 and 50, I think it makes sense because if Tottenham can then also get rid of the, the other players on the list that it looks like we're starting to kind of make some meaningful moves with and that there are ongoing discussions early for outgoing players as well, which is refreshing, then if you've got your striker sorted at, let's just say 40 million pound for argument's sake, it allows you to justify spending that additional money on a player like Eberechi Eze, who we all want, right? Let, let's be honest. Eze is a player that improves us. He is gonna, he's English, he's homegrown. You know, if you can get Tony and Eze done and the Conor Gallagher, then you, you, you're fine for homegrown and you've improved in different areas and he's getting what he wants. The question I'd have about Eberechi Eze, and I'm just playing devil's advocate. He's one of my favorite players. I think he's going to become a future superstar and I'd love to see him in a Tottenham shirt. However, at 68 million pounds as a, as a release fee, first and foremost, the structure of the fee, Crystal Palace, uh, it depends on how it's structured in the contract, but Crystal Palace may demand a lot of it up front, which, which may be off-putting for Tottenham because of our already uh, committed um, player trading liabilities, which is, that we, you can't ever tell what they are. It's very sort of shallowly discussed in the accounts, but they are still significant. I think there's 250 or 300 million pounds right now of player trading liabilities. And if you are paying a lion's share of a transfer fee up front for Eze because it's a release fee being triggered, then that might be off-putting. But even if you don't, even if you can amortize it naturally, it's still a record player, a record signing for Tottenham for a player who I don't think naturally fits any particular position in the Ange system. I don't think he fits in the sort of Pape Sar second eight double pivot role. I think you're playing him too deep and asking him to do something where you're kind of limiting him a little bit. I'm sure he can adapt, but I'm just not sure the, 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 the position is a natural fit. You wouldn't play him on the right. And... Would you play him on the left-hand side? Well, he's not a natural one-on-one -on -one dribble specialist like a Nico Williams or an Antonio Nusso. He's a different type of player. He's more of a 10. He's more of a James Madison. So are you going to spend £68 million on a player and either ask him to adapt and learn a new role 
or are you going to spend 68 million pounds on a player and ask him to compete with someone that you signed last season who everyone was overjoyed that we signed and just because he's had a bit of bad form now people are starting to question I, I find it a little bit strange I, I'm not for, for one second saying I don't want Eze I love Eze but for what it's worth I think you can have the conversation and ask well where does he fit in this squad and are you going to make a record signing have to compete for a starting position you know I'm not sure it, but I think that at least that conversation is easier to justify if you can fill a key position at relatively good value. And that's why I think that Ivan Tony would offer that. I'd much rather us do an Ivan Tony at 40 million than a Serhu Garassi at 20 million, because despite him having two good seasons and a cheap release fee, you know, I think that the number nine is the most important, um, followed by the six or vice versa. They're equally important. And I don't want to see Tottenham scrimp or um, or go for a lower quality player in that position to make Eze work or to make Conor Gallagher work. And so if we can get the deal done, if FFP provides us our strength in that position, it provides us with an opportunity to get ahead of teams that have to wait until next uh, financial year to, before they can trade, then, then let's do it now. Let's get it done early. Uh, and let's see what Brentford, you know, um, what their position and stance is on the situation. I'm sure there'll be other teams that will be in for him, but Arsenal apparently have gone in a different direction and so have Chelsea and the idea that Tony can stay in London, it, kind of, it makes a lot of sense to me. But look, look guys, having said all that about Eberet Eze, I still think, you know, I just, you've got that kind of gut feeling with Eze. The story has just been going on for so long. The fact that they come from the same agency as half of our team, you know, you, you just, even though I've got the question mark around where does he kind of fit, I like the player that much that I think, you know, he'll figure it out and Ange will figure it out. It's better to have the option and to find the solution once you have it than to regret not having it in the first place. For what it's worth, though, you know, there are two other, there's two players at Crystal Palace that have got re um, release fees or release clauses in their contract. And I don't know, arguably, Michael Elise fills a bigger hole and makes more sense to what Tottenham need than Eberechi Eze does at the moment. But guys, we shall see. Let me know your thoughts. Ivan Tony, that was the story. £40 million, pound. Tottenham ready to do it. He wants to come. Do you think Ange will hear what he wants to hear on the phone call? Do you see him in a Tottenham shirt? Let me know your thoughts on that story and the rest. Guys, I wish you a wonderful weekend. Like, subscribe and comment. And as always, bye-bye.